All right. So, what was I saying? Yeah, the animator has some control, some influence over gameplay. Um, designers like to say that they have all the control in the world, but in reality, an animator could make a run cycle faster than it needs to be, and a designer can only bitch um, because they can't go in and fix the animation. Um, so, the animator's a partner in crime here. Um, if if the animator makes poor gameplay decisions, you have poor gameplay. It's that simple. See, not knowing gameplay, not understanding how games work, um, is one of the reasons why film animators have a really tough time in games, because that's not what they're trained on. That's not what they're thinking. So, for example, you have a melee that hits on frame 32 because you've got this big ass wind up. That player presses the melee button. They go on a small break. They take a trip to Europe. Oh, and then they hit the guy. You know, it's too much time, too much time. They press that button. Their expectation is I'm hitting the other motherfucker. I press the button. Um, so your animation anticipation in a third person game would probably be only maybe 10, 12 frames. Um, in a first-person game in Halo, we've got five, four sometimes, depending on if it's a heavier weapon or not. Um, you don't have much in the way of anticipation. Um, so you have to leverage what you have, because the player feeling good when they press that button, it feeling responsive and right to them, is way more important than what you think of your anticipation in your Maya scene. Um, so just keep in mind that this isn't about your animations in Maya. This is about the player expectations, and this is about the end result in game. And getting back to that point I was making about the world, um, Halo, the environments are just so big. Like, everything is getting huge in Halo. Like, you can't have a small object. Like, it's got to be this monolithic thing. God of War suffers from the same thing. Everything's huge. And your character ends up looking like a flea. Um, so in those situations, you want animations that make the character travel really far, really quickly. So you have to make gameplay decisions of fast run cycles, um, broad actions. It's the opposite of the environment you just saw in Uncharted. So a lot of times, you know how in film you have to get the tone of the film, you have to make sure this is a sad scene, you know, this character is going through an emotional change, or, you know, this character feels desperation. Well. Take those concepts and apply them to the environment you're in in a video game. You know, this character needs to be broad. This character is going to feel small in this environment, so they're going to compensate by doing what? So start thinking things less in terms of a linear narrative and more in terms of meeting what you think the player will feel due to the environment they're in, the context, the situation, the responsiveness of the gameplay. Like when I worked on Condemned, um, which my favorite game to work on ever, by the way. Uh, this is this totally unique first-person melee horror game. Not many people have ever done anything like it. Um, so it was first-person melee combat, which is extremely rare to begin with, and then um, going horror route, but realism horror. Well, well, the first one was. The second one went off the rails. But um, one of the things I could get away with is I could have attacks that take a little bit longer to get out because we want the player to feel fear, and we want a little bit of panic built in. So by making an anticipation 15 frames in, in, um, in Condemned, it's like the player hits a button, and then the weapon comes out. And it's like, <laughs> you know, they, they have that sense of panic, like, ah, oh, God, he's coming out, he's coming out. So I wanted to build in that timing, that sense of, you know, it's fast enough to be effective, so they feel like they're still in control, but slow enough to make them feel a little yeah, tension over the whole thing. So, um, building and all of that is then put on a separate layer. No, it's, it's, it's your animation. So, let's say you're doing an attack. You're in an idol, right? And your hit frame looks like this, right? So, between here and here is your anticipation. And then from here is your follow through. So, how it all works out in a gameplay setting, and I'll explain this all in the melee combat set. Um, from your idle to your hit frame is your anticipation. And then there's your hit frame. It's a one frame event. Usually projects out a cone, causes damage, everyone's happy. And then your follow through 
is how long you want the character to settle before they can act again. So if they're doing this, they can't be running, they can't be swinging again, they're busy following through with the action. So the longer your follow through, um, the more you lock them in whatever you're doing. And then more advanced animators, more advanced users, when you get more experience, you start setting up break frames, meaning I'm still playing this full follow through, but if I do specific actions, I can break out of that follow through into different actions. And those are triggered off of what we call frame events, which are special keyframes we set, saying beyond this point, you could break out into these set certain things. Programmer set, it, set, set those rules up for us, and we trigger them at certain points in time. So, again, it's, it's more about your in-game performance and less about what it looks like in your Maya scene. So when I start, and I'm going to start really harping on this in the next few weeks, is you're not animating a Maya file. And we're certainly not shipping with shipping you with the game to explain to every user that buys the game why you made the decisions you made. But that's not efficient, and you get very tired. So your work has to hold up to their perception without you there to explain. Um, so I'm here to teach you not how to sell your ideas, but how to sell the expectations of the player. 